We have about nine plants around the world making LC3 today, and we know there's about 20 or 30 coming on stream in the next two to three years. But of course, we want to take this, you know, further. You know, we want to see a hundred, maybe a thousand plants producing LC3, because there we can get the really massive CO2 reductions worldwide. It's a solution which is totally scalable. You could adopt it in just about every cement plant. I mean, practically maybe 70% of cement plants. And you can do it quite fast because it depends on existing equipment for manufacture. problem in the industry is inertia. You know, a cement plant is working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 340 days a year. And in that situation, people don't want to change anything. They don't want to look left or right. They just want to keep producing what they're producing today. So it takes an incredible amount of effort to persuade people this is important. When you look to the global south, there's 
certainly more than one billion people living in what we call slum conditions, uh, population still growing, uh, people are moving to cities, and we need to provide these people decent living conditions. Plus, for an essential part of development is infrastructure. We need decent roads and railways to move things around. And this all takes concrete. People often talk about things like wood, but today wood is just this very small amount of building materials. And that's already not sustainable on a worldwide basis. We're cutting down more trees than we're planting. There's nothing wrong with wood, it's a great material, but we simply haven't got enough of it to make any substantial uh, impact on how much concrete we use. We have to think about using concrete more efficiently rather than this illusion that we can replace it with something else. Techno-pessimism, which becomes almost a mantra that the technology is bad, the firms are bad and they're out to get us, is really, really quite unhelpful. It's almost as unhelpful as a starry-eyed utopianism. We actually live in a space where we require critical reflection, a kind of pragmatic optimism about these technologies, a recognition that there will be benefits and disbenefits, and we have to engage to control and maintain those, give people on both sides of this gulf of incomprehension the tools to understand what the processes are and what the risks are and what questions they should ask uh, of the world around them. Technology is power and we have ways of dealing with power. We understand its benefits in society and we also understand what happens when any institution gets too much power. In order to do that, you need checks and balances, you need a balance of power, you need rival power centers that can hold one another to account, and you might need some enforceable guardrails. We're in an interesting time that I call the exponential age. It's the exponential age because there's a series of technologies that are getting cheaper and cheaper every year on a compounding basis. And today, uh, in the start of the 21st century, we see that computing is on that curve, things like memory storage are on that curve, but so too are lithium ion batteries, solar photovoltaics, uh, and a whole series of technologies from the bioeconomy, like precision fermentation, or genome sequencing. Now what that means is the technologies get better or to look at it a different way, they get much, much cheaper. As they get much cheaper, they're much more likely to be bought by businesses and consumers, put to use in industry and start to change the shape of industries. The gulf of mutual incomprehension is what emerges between the technologists and those who understand how the technologies are behaving, uh, and really the rest of us, right, who are living in a more everyday world. On the side of the typical person in society, the incomprehension ar arises from not realizing quite how quickly the technology might change, how quickly it might diffuse. Uh, and I think quite often, what is very, very hard is what those unintended and emergent consequences of the technologies uh, end up being. Today, things that happen in the natural world can be the sources of security crises and they can go from small uh, triggers to big effects very, very quickly. Historically, that we have these kind of two communities. We have a community that thinks about international peace and security, and they maintain the force of arms and the resources to ensure a durable peace among nations. And we have people who are thinking about 
the natural world, scientists and conservationists and people who are thinking about climate change. And they're really two different kinds of cultures. They're different kinds of people. And that means we need to create bridges between the, uh, the national security world and the natural security world. And those bridges are bridges of culture and shared understanding because, you know, you can't shoot a missile at climate change. You can't uh, invade a sandstorm. If you create an environment where people are hungry, suddenly they become restless and they begin to move and then you have migration changes and those migration changes can show up in complicated ways geopolitically and they can be uh, uh, sources of stress and tension and, and change. So everything is connected to everything else. You take the same disaster, the same disruption and whether it's an earthquake or a typhoon uh, exacerbated by climate change or whether it's a food shock uh, to, the, to the food security system, and it's just going to have a much bigger effect in 2025 than it, the exact same problem would have had in 1950. A solvable problem yesterday becomes a major global crisis tomorrow. One of the most powerful tools we can use is to use instruments in space. They let us see every act of deforestation, the growth or the, the lack of growth of every, uh, every uh, uh, crop in every field around the world. They let us see disruptions to global supply chains. And they also allow us to see when uh, malevolent actors often abuse the rights of their fellow uh, citizens. And so whether that's watching governments burn villages after they've kicked people out of their communities, or whether it's connecting information that we see from space to mobile phone records, to patterns of change on the ground uh, that allow us to attribute actions to specific actors. Mm -hmm.